Hello, everyone. I'm Betsy Rapaski from Roswell Park in Buffalo, New York. And I would like to thank the Focused Ultrasound Foundation and the Cancer Research Institute for this in invitation to provide a, a brief overview of issues related to hyperthermia and cancer immunity that I've learned to be important over many years. But what I've also tried to do is to include a more personal view of what I consider to be several important goals for researchers who may be thinking of just starting to study ultrasound um, and immunity based on what we've learned in the past in clinical um, hyperthermia. Uh, so I have a series of points here that I'd like to briefly make uh, during my presentation. Um, and that is that very few preclinical pre studies in hyperthermia have actually utilized the similar heating methods that have been used in the successful patient studies. And with the exception of a few clinical trials using canine cancer patients. Uh, instead, most preclinical work has not used RF heating, but have used warm air and, and hot water or warm water. And I think this difference may be very critical to the gaps in our understanding of how hyperthermia affects the immune response in patient uh, clinical hyperthermia trials. Nevertheless, I won't have time to present much of this at all today, but there is strong decades of preclinical data linking these thermal signals to improved immune cell activation and function. While measurement of tissue temperatures achieved upon thermal therapy is critical, and it has to be included in our understanding of the effects on immunity, there are a lot of other new and exciting biomarkers emerging, and I'll give you one example of that. I'm also very encouraged by recent strong preclinical data showing significant positive effect of MR-guided focus ultrasound on the immune system. And again, this is critical because here in preclinical studies, investigators are using ultrasound, which will also and is also being used in patients. So that I think is very helpful in bridging this gap in terms of the impact of heating protocols. So I think the most important concern for focused ultrasound in clinical trials is to choose at least one rational endpoint for the effects of hyperthermia on immunity and test for it during the clinical trial. Um, if, if brain is the target of ultrasound, I think that it's important that we keep in mind that brain heating may actually change thermoregulatory responses in the rest of the system. And that has implications for uh, immunotherapy. So now very briefly, I wanted to introduce the body heat balance equation um, and to emphasize that we still do not know how a variety of heating protocols, including RF or ultrasound, affect this equation in terms of heat storage, metabolism, and mechanisms of heat loss, such as conduction. We know a lot more, in fact, about exercise and fever in terms of their metabolic effects on heat generation in the body than we do about how these protocols affect the body heat balance equation. And, and this includes work that we've, I've done in my lab using hot air we really have much to learn about how changing the environment changes metabolism, but for sure we're convinced that this in the end will influence the anti-tumor immune response. To remind everyone, skin is inundated with warm and cold thermoreceptors. It's the first and most sensitive line of defense to adverse therm thermal stimulus, or in our case, to therapy. It is the organ for control of heat exchange and can regulate massive changes in thermoregulatory uh, changes in blood flow. Um, skin heating results in a very rapid and strong thermoregulatory response. And I bring this up because in our data using mice with warm water or warm air, 
we're using an external heat source that first heats the skin. So that results in a very rapid thermal sensation, very effective feelings of hot or feeling cold and an autonomic response changing blood flow all over the body. On the other hand, an RF source is going to heat internally and this is a much slower thermal sensation because it takes some time before the organ of heat sensitivity, the skin actually is affected. And to me, this fundamental difference in terms of the impact on the immune response is yet to be resolved in clinical hyperthermia. Um, one of the most advanced techniques that we're using right now is demonstrated, I think it, in its best form in this cancer research paper from Arlene Oy's uh, thesis work uh, in Johannes Crazy's lab, uh, where they can and heat up many, many mice and keep the tumors all the same size and get wonderful data using local heating of the skin um, below which there's a tumor. But keep in mind that this procedure is heating the skin first. Um, this is very exciting uh, data that they're able to achieve, however, uh, and very statistically relevant, robust effects of hyperthermia on tumor growth using this protocol. Our laboratory uh, uses a warm air protocol, similar concept. Um, and basically most of my work has come from looking at very mild uh, increases in core body temperature, again, through warm air heating of skin first. Uh, this data from our group and many others uh, has led to a large number of effects on the tumor microenvironment that have been described and I won't go into this in detail. There are other good reviews of this, um, but lots of changes that have the potential to synergize wonderfully with immunotherapy. So I'm very excited about uh, data, which will be emerging, I'm sure in the near future on combinations of hyperthermia with immunotherapy. And some of the data that involve blood flow, bringing more lymphocytes in through uh, migratory changes, uh, changes in NK cell activity and metabolic rate are all potentially synergistic with immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors. Now I'd like to emphasize or highlight a very recent paper from Eric Pierce's lab using fever range hyperthermia. And here they've discovered that in CD8 T cells, one of the most critical cells in uh, carrying out the effector activity of anti-tumor immunity and in synergy with cancer immunotherapy, um, the mitochondrial translation of RNA is influenced, regulated by mild changes in, in temperatures. This is a very exciting work that I would recommend uh, everyone to take a look at because of the implications of this from my point of view as, as a biomarker, a very simple way to isolate blood cells and determine the impact of, of thermal uh, heating. And I wanna pay homage here to a paper that Mark Hurwitz, my colleague wrote over 10 years ago, talking about changes in the field of hyperthermia being not your father's hyperthermia. And I would say that this paper definitely points in the direction of a whole new set of molecular markers by help us understand what thermal signals are actually doing in the immune system. Now, this is a couple of pieces of data that I pulled from this, talking about just how mild this temperature change is in CD8 T cell activity. There's an increased mitochondrial mass as well as increased RNA translation. And importantly, they've demonstrated in a very clinically relevant adoptive T cell protocol that there were survival benefits to heating cells actually in vitro and then adding them heat primed T cells uh, to a mouse model of cancer. So altogether, very exciting new directions. Now, another example I'd like to present is from the field of focused ultrasound. And this is a paper very recent from Catherine Ferrara's lab that I find really encouraging because it talks about immune modulation, again, using um, high-intensity focused ultrasound in a model of murine breast cancer. Uh, 
the same protocol or the same basic scientific principles that would be applied in humans. And that to me is a big advance uh, that focused ultrasound uh, research is taking. Um, this is some of the data that I pulled from this paper where they're using a more ablative temperature, but combining it with immune checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-1 um, and CPG is another immunotherapy. So they're looking at uh, innate immune response and also they're looking at adaptive immune responses in genes that not only um, in the treated tumor, but in, uh, in terms of distant tumor control. So altogether a very exciting and encouraging new paper that I think will re should receive a lot of attention in terms of providing a scientific rationale for combining ultrasound with immunotherapy. The last point that I would like to make is on brain heating, which is of very big interest in ultrasound and also laser and, and hyperthermia. It's important to know that even with ablative heating, there's going to be zones of more mild temperatures. And what happens when you heat the brain? Well, actually the brain does have quite a few thermal receptors, not as many as skin, but it does respond to temperature changes particularly if that part of the brain involves thermoregulatory centers. And it's extremely important, I think, that we keep in mind that one of the first responses to an increase in brain temperature is increased skin blood flow in the rest of the body. Um, but in fact, isolated heating of thermoregulatory centers can lead to a lowering of core body temperature. And um, because of an overcompensating response. So I think it's important to realize that brain heating may change parameters of, of thermoregulation that could affect systemic activity of checkpoint inhibitors or other immunotherapies. So finally, I'm just going to uh, end with a restatement of some of the points that I've tried to make today one of which in the field of hyperthermia, we have not matched preclinical studies with clinical uh, protocols in terms of how we heat. And I think that's going to be a big gap that we need to fill to truly understand how hyperthermia using RF, for example, is going to affect the immune system. And there are some preclinical studies out there using RF, but we need to do a lot more of, of that. Uh, on the other hand, they've gotten a lot of preclinical data talking about um, how strong the immune response is influenced by hyperthermia. Um, very recent data on mitochondrial, for example, mitochondria and its effect of heat on mitochondria is emerging. I think that gives us a lot of exciting new biomarkers to test for in terms of the impact of hyperthermia on the immune response. So it's more than just measuring temperature, but we now have a big database and some very exciting new markers for immunity. Um, I'm very encouraged by the strong preclinical data showing a positive effect of, of MR-guided focused ultrasound on the immune response. And I think that the biggest concern in clinical applications with immunotherapy is that investigators need to choose at least one endpoint to monitor in terms of the immune response, something like mitochondrial RNA translation or a CD8 T cell activation and test for it in clinical trials. And to remember that in treating brain tumors, you may be changing uh, thermal properties in the rest of the body that could uh, interfere with the, the effects of hyperthermia on, uh, for example, checkpoint immunotherapy. So that, it leaves me with uh, uh, the uh, request that any questions or comments that you have, please feel free to email me. And I want to again thank the organizers for this uh, opportunity and look forward to the workshop.